Limitations suck, right? Well, not always. When designing furniture, sometimes constraints actually guide design and push you beyond current skill limits, force you to take risks, and elevate your artistry to new heights. This piece did that for me, and it started with being handed a pile of scrapped Wenge countertops. Let's get into it. These two big chunks of Wenge were really heavy. It's kind of hard to think of them as scraps, but they are. I'll get into that story in a second. I didn't like how these two chunks had slightly different colored quarters on boards glued in, and since I need a couple longish pieces for the base stretcher in this table, I cut them free and started prepping the stretcher blank. But first, I needed to brush my teeth. Wenge is a super dense exotic wood, which means it's also incredibly hard and really heavy. Cleaning my saw blade before working with it here will help keep my cuts clean, safe, and burn free. I like making things, and woodworking really suits me because in my mind it's this incredible blend of creativity, art, and problem solving. And unless you're making a replica of an existing piece, the design process can be particularly challenging. It's a bit like getting writer's block, but for drawing. So when it's time to design a piece of furniture, it's actually good to have some constraints that give you a starting point to work from. In this project, my only constraints were to make a coffee table and the wood I had to use, which meant I had to design this table around the size of the available material. With that in mind, let's take a second and talk about the table I'm going to make. It's 48 inches long, 21 inches wide, and 16 inches tall. The Wenge top sits on a trestle style base inspired by the designs of George Nakashima. Two curly maple legs straddle a central Wenge stretcher. The stretcher and feet have 20 degree angles on all sides. All the joints are made to be interlocking and I'm going to make these joints without any screws, dowels, or dominoes. Finally, the faces between the legs are skinned in a Wenge veneer as a final detail. When my client told me he had bought all this Wenge for a hundred bucks, I was honestly kind of shocked. I had only ever seen Wenge used in really small quantities and for small things like drawer pulls and inlay details on guitars. And he was bringing me enough Wenge to make the whole top of this coffee table. It's shocking because as an endangered exotic hardwood native to regions of Africa like the Congo, Cameroon, Gabon, and Equatorial Guinea, Wenge is incredibly expensive. At my local hardwood store, it cost $22 a board foot. By comparison, 8 quarter black walnut, one of the most expensive local species, is $11 a board foot. And let's make one final thing really clear. Its name is pronounced Wenge. If you call this wood whinge, woodworkers will cringe. With the top cut to a rough shape from this big chunk of Wenge and the Wenge stretcher glued up, I'll start milling up some curly maple for the rest of the base parts. And this is how I know it's curly maple. See? Right there it says curly maple. So here I just made a cardboard template to mark out the rough shape of my leg parts in order to avoid waste in this particularly curly piece. Since I need these to be around two and a half inches thick, I've got to do a careful glue up, making sure to get a tight seam and try to get the green to match. Okay, so you might be wondering how in the world my client got this huge pile of Wenge, probably worth over a thousand bucks, for just a hundred. When he brought the material over, there were some clues as to what happened. This piece here shows it definitely used to have a high gloss finish on it and had a big round over. And this one proves something catastrophic happened to it, all these broken edges. These aren't just offcuts, right? When I asked the client where it all came from, he said he got it from a guy who had used this wood to build his own kitchen countertops. He said the guy got his countertops all done and installed and was enjoying them, and one night in the middle of the night, he heard a super loud pop come from the kitchen. And when he went to inspect it, one section had completely cracked in half, and the guy just goes nuts. He was so upset seeing his countertops destroyed that he just grabbed them and ripped them out the rest of the way and finished the job instead of trying to repair it. I knew immediately why it happened. 
and even found evidence for my theory. He must have attached the countertops to his cabinets by just screwing them in from the underside wherever, and in particular, across the grain. He just used screws and didn't do anything to allow for wood movement. And the relative humidity change from outside in his shop to indoors in the air conditioning caused the boards to contract and eventually to crack, pulling themselves apart because they were screwed tightly into place without allowing room for this expansion and contraction. These screw holes prove it. And so he just sold the scraps to my client for cheap. I guess he figured it would be hard to sell wood that had already been processed for market value and just wanted it out of his sight. Okay, with my leg blinks all milled up, I'll grab my cardboard template and mark up my legs again, only this time I'll sharpen up all the lines so that I can see them clearly and cut them out on the bandsaw. Normally this sort of odd shape would be an ideal candidate for template routing, and I considered that. But because I'm working with curly maple here, I was a little worried about getting a lot of tear out while using a router. And that's because the figure in curly maple is caused by pressure and stresses that the tree was under while it was growing that resulted in these really frequent grain reversals. Figured wood likes to be cut with the grain and tends to split out little chunks when cutting opposite the grain. It takes more care to accurately cut out all four to the exact same size this way, but as you see here, I came up with a few processes to dial them in. I didn't feel great about how close to the blade my hand was on that first one, so it felt right to change it up for the others. Even on the jointer, these faces had a little tear out. But since I needed to get them all exactly the same size anyway, I figured I might as well just sand them into shape. So I started off by saying this table pushed me beyond my current skill levels. And it's true. I went into this project with only a vague idea of how I was going to create all these joints. It's easy enough to draft them out in a 3D modeling software like Fusion but when the time comes to start cutting into real wood that you've paid money for and invested time into processing, it's still a little scary to make cuts like this. And not scary as in it might fly off the table saw and hurt me, but as in I might mess something up and ruin the piece, setting me back a lot of time and money. But you can counter that by slowing down and taking your time, especially to make jigs like this high fence jig that lets me safely guide these parts through on end knowing the blade is going to stay 90 degrees and on my layout line. The best way to mitigate mistakes is to slow down and at least plan a few steps ahead at a time in order to determine order of operations. However, like in this case, I found using the table saw to clear the middle out like I had planned to be really slow. In those cases, it's fine to consider alternative approaches as long as you don't sacrifice quality in the process. It still worked great to cut the outer sides of the joint on the table saw, but the bandsaw was much faster to handle the rest. Okay, back to this stretcher. It needs to be turned into a rectangle. Well, technically a rectangular prism. And if you think prisms always have to be transparent, you'd be wrong. I asked ChatGPT and it says I'm right. And ChatGPT is always right, right? You might have noticed that before I was wearing gloves when handling the Wenge while it was rough. That's because Wenge is one of the few species that can cause infections if you get a splinter. But now that I've smoothed it up, it should be safe to handle. I've got to lay out a bunch of lines to cut the joinery, which I've identified in my plans. And if you're wondering, this is a ceramic mechanical pencil, which is a dream to use on dark woods like walnut and Wenge. Like all the other tools I'm using in this video, I'll have a link in the description for it if you want to pick one up for yourself. 
And speaking of the video description and all the other buttons below this video, if you're enjoying it so far, it would mean a lot if you'd let me know by pressing like and subscribing to the channel. I really appre Ow! appreciate it. Yep, got a Wenge splinter. Thankfully, it came right out. Gotta watch those corners. I still have a few things to do before I can consider the legs finished, but I needed to work on the stretcher first so that I could create this straight grained offcut, because this is what I'm going to use to make the veneers that will go on the inside faces. It's always super satisfying to be able to make parts that are nearly 3 seconds of an inch thick. Here's another place where I had to improvise. If I had planned out these steps more efficiently, I guess I could have glued on the veneers before cutting the legs to final shape and not had this odd issue of having an angled face where I needed clamping pressure. But it didn't take much to devise a way to get all four clamped up without too much drama. I have to admit something. It genuinely took me a long time after I started woodworking to learn how to intentionally oversize parts and plan for processes like flush trimming or cutting to final length. It's an important part of nearly every woodworking project. The rule goes something like, don't cut anything away until you have to. I made sure that these were about 3 16 bigger than they needed to be on all sides before glue up. That said, even here, I had to pivot from my initial plan. See, because Wenge is pretty brittle in general and my veneers are really straight grained, they wanted to split and shatter when using a small router bit with a high RPM. So I changed course and went over to the router table to use the big boy flush trim bit. This is the ultimate flush trim bit from Whiteside and astrocoded by Bits and Bits, and I love it. It's huge so you pretty much have to run it on a variable speed router and on a low RPM. But it's exactly what I needed here to avoid ripping out chunks of veneer and having to start all over. And it was kind enough to leave me just a little satisfying hand tool work too. And speaking of router bits, it's also a good idea on basically any woodworking project to round over your corners, even if you want to maintain a really square look. In that case, you can use a tiny round over bit like this 1 16th inch bit to take off only the bare minimum material. This helps prevent chip out on them and also ensures that no one else will get a nasty Wenge splinter. With that done, I'm thinking it's a sign to start fitting the top part of the leg, which will have recesses cut out of it that are mirror images of the open-ended mortises we just cut on the vertical parts. When these are perfectly aligned, it's like God himself made the two corresponding shapes fit like puzzle pieces from the wood they're made of, which is called a bridle joint. Now, I had honestly been dreading this part of the build. Not so much because I fear using my dado stack, but because I truly have no way to manage the incredible amount of dust it creates. And I have a lot of cuts to make because each of these leg part tops needs four big sections cut away, and the Wingate stretcher has more than that. There's nothing quite like 30 to 40 minutes of just getting completely blasted in the face with untamed sawdust. I know there are overarm dust collection systems out there, and this kind of work more than any makes me feel ready to open my wallet and spend any amount to remedy this problem. That said, it's still wildly faster and more accurate than cutting them all by hand. And the minimal amount of cleanup at the bottom of these with my vintage Stanley 71.5 router plane is actually pretty enjoyable. This next step is important to do on this joint on the bottom faces of these leg toppers or whatever we should call them. And that's because it allows the seams where the joints meet at the bottom to overlap just slightly, which hides any imperfections that might exist in the bottom of the mortise on the leg joint. For this, I'll show a different method than the dado stack. What I'm gonna do is first make the outer cuts with a handsaw, then remove the waste with a router. Making these cuts first is an alternative to using a template. 
You'll see how this method works using a template later on. Moments like this are so satisfying, especially when I've been mindful to stay patient and slowly dial in the fit like this. The final task to complete shaping my leg top cross support arm thingies is to cut the angles on the ends and again round over all the edges. These operations are super straightforward. Now, at this moment, you're watching me make a mistake in real time. I made a big deal earlier about how planning ahead is so important and making plans to lay out dimensions is smart, but this step is exactly why that only takes you so far. What happened here is that by attempting to perform every cut according to my plans, I had a misplaced confidence that these layout lines were in the right place. I should have taken measurements off of my actual work pieces to make sure these two gaps ended up the same instead of relying on the measurements from my plans that I had drawn on the piece earlier on. See, after milling, this stretcher ended up being slightly narrower than was planned. So when I measured 7 eighths or whatever from each side, like the plan said, the remaining material in the middle was too narrow. Thankfully, this mistake didn't have too many consequences and only set me back the time it took to cut some filler pieces of Wenge with matching grain and glue them in. Once it dried and the excess was trimmed away, you can hardly tell it was ever an issue. And this area will be hidden between the two legs anyway once it's assembled. With that handled, I can now keep going by cutting these to the correct depth. This is also the moment I can start working on the joinery for the feet. This might be the most complex joint I've ever made in my woodworking career. The way these feet interlock with the stretcher is effectively just a fancy half lap joint in which both pieces have extra recesses in order to wrap around each other. It's really kind of hard to explain, so if my explanation is confusing here, just keep watching and you'll see it come together. But basically, it starts by making cuts equal in height to half the height of the feet. Then the width of the foot blanks are marked on the piece, which sets the bottom of the angles we need to cut out on the stretcher, which will become the recesses that accept the angled shape of the feet. I'll translate those angles onto the feet themselves and cut those bevels on the table saw. I've said this was the hardest joint I've ever created, and I mean it. It's an odd feeling to simultaneously be excited about an operation and a project like this and afraid of screwing it up at the same time. I guess it's actually some type of adrenaline response. It's exciting because it's a new adventure of sorts, but equally raises feelings of anxiety because there are stakes involved. I could really screw this up if I don't get this right on the first try. And that's exactly what happened. My approach was okay. These acrylic plates make great template routing guides, but I should have come up with a way to guide the top of the cut as well. My initial plan was to cut close to that line and cut out the rest with chisels. Then I could remove the guides and let the initial cut guide the router for the rest of the depth of cut that I needed. But instead, I goofed up on the first attempt. I immediately went back into repair mode to fix it. I found a piece of scrap wenge from the same board and worked up this small chunk to glue in. And it's about at this moment that I realized that I was probably going to be cutting this whole repair away later on when I put all the angles onto the stretcher. But because I wasn't sure, I went ahead with it anyway. With that repair done, I figured out how to make the rest basically perfect by adding this third plate to the process. Okay. 
I've talked a bit already about how order of operations is so critical and how forgetting or missing a step can be costly. Well, here's another example of that. It isn't catastrophic, but because I didn't cut out the sides of these joints before cutting the bevels onto the feet, I now have to get it done without having a flat, square surface available to reliably run them through a power tool and cut them quickly. Enter hand tools. And this isn't a knock on hand tools, I'm just not that great with them and care more about getting these to fit snugly than perfecting my chisel skills. But often, having to use hand tools instead of machines is the mother of invention. It gave me time to think about how to get it done without having to do all four of these by hand, and I have to say, it worked pretty well. There are some designs, however, that no thinking about order of operations can make it simple to achieve without involving some ingenuity. Now, this is not the jig I would have made if I were going to mass produce this table, but in a pinch, you can rely pretty heavily on pressure activated tape and a couple of screwed together chunks of plywood. At least that's what I did in this case, for better or worse. But that gets into the question that every woodworker has faced. When do I make nice jigs? I don't think the answer is just about how often you think you'll reuse it. I think the real answer is more like, always make the jig as nice as you need it to be to get the job done safely, accurately, and efficiently, in that order. I'll save the rest of my thoughts on that for a later video. I'll admit that this next operation was on my mind a lot before I got to this point. I knew it had to basically be last, but I was really worried that I was going to blow it somehow and cause kickback that would launch this 15 pound chunk of wing gate across my shop like a missile. I took an approach I've used before to perform resaw operations on a table saw where you start with a blade low and make multiple passes, raising the blade between cuts. It honestly worked really well, even with the blade set at a bevel. It let me make cuts on both sides while keeping a square corner supporting the ride along the fence. That is, until the last pass. See, the off cut had come off at that point, and my fence wasn't tall enough. After watching the footage, I really wish I had done this differently. What I did is I basically used the back side of my high fence to get the extra height that I needed. But this was really dangerous because that jig is only around 18 inches long. This left gaps along the front and back of the fence that could have allowed the piece to twist during the cut causing kickback that would have either ruined the piece or hurt me pretty badly. It worked out fine, but I can guarantee I won't be taking this kind of risk again in the future. Well, I promised angles on all sides, and there are only two more to do. The blue tape here is to help mitigate grain tear out on the back side of these cuts. Alright, I know it's been a while since we've seen the top of this piece, but it's time to finish this panel's transformation from DIY countertop scrap to high-end furniture component. And it honestly required much more work than you might think. I had to take multiple passes with the track saw because there's something bent or broken in it that I can't figure out. But I got it done. However, because of that issue, I couldn't use it to cut the bevels on the underside like I normally would. These rip cuts along the sides were fine, but here's another cut that I hope to never have to make again on a table saw. I'm really grateful for this new drum sander I just got. It takes up a lot less space in my shop than my old one and saved me a ton of pain straightening out this panel, which was nowhere near flat. 
but I'm also really grateful for my Lim's shoes. I've been wearing these casually for over a year now and just started wearing them as my shop shoes. I reached out to Lim's to tell them what a difference they've been making for me on long days in the shop, and the amazing team there was kind enough to send me a complimentary pair to keep me on my feet for the next year. All of their shoes and boots are designed with a wide toe box and zero drop soles, which emulates how your feet are naturally positioned when standing barefoot. This is not a sponsorship, but as an affiliate, I'll put a couple links in the description where you can pick up a pair for yourself. And if you do, it'll help the channel. Either way, to my friends over at Limbs, thanks for the shoes. I always have mixed feelings about this part of the project where all that's left to do is the fine detail stuff like sanding and finishing. On one hand, it's boring, monotonous work that happens to be incredibly important to delivering an excellent product. And on the other, it's exciting to be so close to finally seeing this whole thing come together that has so far only been a drawing or vision I can see in my mind's eye. But being the more mindless work that it is, it also provides a chance to think about the fact that what I actually do for a living is art. It's a funny thought to me because I don't come out here every day thinking of myself as an artist. Yet every layout line, every cut on a machine, and every simple pass of a sander over the material is done in pursuit of crafting an object that, hopefully, someone will enjoy looking at. What I mean is, my hope is someone will feel something when they see it. Isn't that what art actually is in essence? The creation of an object that invokes an emotion of appreciation on some level? I realize that's pretty heady stuff, but believe me, I had a lot of sanding to do. At any rate, it's finally time to put this thing together and show it to you. And who knows, maybe you'll have that emotion of appreciation I was hoping for when you see it. This is definitely one of those projects that makes me grateful to not always have limitless options. If I didn't have to figure out how to best use this wenge to design a coffee table, I'm not sure this design would even exist. In fact, the constraints actually taught me to dream big, seek to find the beauty in what was once rejected, and push through the mistakes along the way and realize my vision. I hope you enjoyed seeing it come together too. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.